Anyway, okay, cooler. Uh, caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. My name is Jessica. I'm calling from California. Jessica from California. Um, Welcome. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, with Christmas, um, Christians recounting the story of Jesus' birth, um, they say that it was foretold by the Magi, um, seen in the stars, and then they followed the star to where Jesus was born. And who exactly was the Magi, and why weren't the Jewish um, able to see it in the stars, as they say? And then they also say that it was further acknowledged by King Herod, because he then ordered um, all of the Jewish infant boys to be murdered um, because the Messiah was coming. So you're asking me, just to be clear, why do Christians believe this? Why is Matthew conveying the story? Like, uh, is, Does you... it have any historical standing? Is there um, history of King Herod actually ordering this infanticide mm. for the Jewish people because he is acknowledging that the Messiah has come? And how could another culture like the Magi um, foretell a Jewish Messiah, I guess. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Jessica, go ahead and hang up now. To Thank you. Answer. Okay. Thanks for your call. Bye-bye. So th the story that Jessica asked about is unique to the book of Matthew. These are people from the East, non-Jews, Persian, almost certainly. The word magic has its origins in that word. And, and in the ancient world, in the Persian world, people who studied the stars and people who performed magic, that was interchangeable. The key point that Matthew is conveying is that non-Jews were looking for the Messiah and Jews were not. The whole point of Matthew chapter 2, the infancy narrative, is to convey that whereas the Gentiles were looking for the Messiah, the Jews were not. Worse, the Jews would do everything possible to kill the Messiah. The story in the book of Matthew is completely made up. It's not historical, but it is a brilliant device to convey how the Gentiles are seeking after God, have a simple desire to follow God, and the Jews detest and reject the Messiah and seek only his death. And as it turns out, Matthew chapter 2 would parallel Matthew chapter 27 perfectly. It's, they parallel. I mean, this is, these are bookends. The story that it comes up in Matthew, and as I said, the, the infancy narrative, which is found only in Matthew and Luke. There are 89 chapters in the Gospels, but only four of those 89 chapters contain an infancy narrative. Two of them are in Matthew, two of them are in Luke, and they are wildly different. In Matthew, the family... Mary and Joseph are originally from Bethlehem. That's home. That's where they start off. In Luke, the family begins in Nazareth and has to come to Bethlehem because of some census. None of that, that made up census, people had to go back to their hometown. That's all made up. And Luke is using a completely different plot device. There's no Magi following stars in Luke. It's not that they're just providing different information. They contradict each other so completely that even believing Christian scholars uh, can't explain the contradictions. I want to focus on Matthew. Matthew wants to convey that whereas the Jews are blind, worse, that the Jews are enemies of Christ, worse, the Jews want to kill the Messiah, worse, the Jews refuse to worship the Messiah, but the Gentiles want to worship the Messiah, just like the, 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 Roman, the Roman soldier at the cross who recognizes the centurion. Who's that? Like a it's like a, practically a general. It's a very high-level Roman soldier that recognizes this is truly the Son of God. The, the Roman gets it, and the Jews don't, and the Jews are conspiring 
to have Jesus crucified and conspiring to pay off the Roman soldiers to claim that they fell asleep. I mean, so the Jews are evil and they are conspiring to destroy God and his plan for salvation. Now let's go back and you'll see it in the text. So the Magi are following a star uh, and they wind up at, in Jerusalem in Herod's palace. Okay. We don't know how many Magi there are. People think Matthew is describing three, and that's how the coloring books describe because there are three presents given later, but the, actually we're not told. The key is that they're following a star in the sky to Jerusalem. So if they're, they're coming from the east. Let's just say they're coming from Persia, modern-day Iran. Okay? That's how the story is told. And they're looking for the Messiah, and there's a magical star that they can follow. I don't want to get into the idea of how do you follow a star? Like, what does that mean? It's a magical star, and this magical star has magical properties. And this story is found in mythologies all over the place, in the not only the Greco-Roman world and in the Far East, but let's, I want to set that all aside. They follow a star and they come to Herod's palace and they ask the question, where is the Messiah to be born? Herod actually doesn't know in the story because Herod is not really Jewish. He's an Edomite. He doesn't know anything. Okay, But there are Jews there. There are Pharisees there. There are scribes there. There are, pre there are important people smart Jews that are there who say the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem based on the passage in Micah chapter 5 verse 2 in a Christian Bible 5 1 in a Jewish Bible. That's Matthew chapter 2 verse 6. Now the author of Matthew is going to just rip apart that verse meaning the end of the passage in Micah chapter 5 is removed and something else is put in instead to make it look like the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So it's completely misconstrued. What we are told in Micah 5, 2, again in a Christian Bible, 5, 1 in a Jewish Bible, there will be a ruler, and that's toy on the Messiah, and his connection, Umoitsaisav, and his connection to Bethlehem is that is from early, from ancient times. Meaning, the Messiah who's yet to come, Michael lived 2,700 years ago, so the Messiah who's yet to come will come in the future, he will be connected to Bethlehem, not because he's born in Bethlehem, but Umitsayisav, and his origin, his connection is Mikedem from earlier times, from Kaidem, from the earliest time, Mime Olam from the earlier days. That is removed, is cut out. You'd have to compare, I implore you, if you are a Christian, just open up Micah 5.2, so using Christian Bible, and then if you can have two Bibles next to you, because it makes it easy to look at both, and look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, and you'll see what's happened. And his origins are from ancient times, from earlier times, appears in your Micah 5, 2. I don't care if you use a King James. I don't care what you do. Some of them have it from eternity because they want to amp it up more. Whatever. You'll see that the text is saying in Micah that the ruler, who's the Mashiach, his connection to Bethlehem is not that he's born in Bethlehem, but because of an ancient connection from a long, long time ago. Who was born in Bethlehem? We know who was born in Bethlehem. King David. How do you know? It says it. See 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 56 as an example. So, so I just people get are confused by this. I just want to explain this. Take an extra moment because I get this question too often. Micah lived 2,700 years ago during the Assyrian Empire, which means he lived roughly 300 years after King David. Okay, you got that? So King David is, lived about 3,000 years ago. Micah, Isaiah, they lived about 2,700 years ago. These prophets, Micah in particular, is saying that the future ruler who will come 
has a connection to Beis Lechem. What is the connection? The future ruler who is the Mashiach, his connection to Bethlehem will not be that he is born in Bethlehem, but Umaytsaysav, which means his going forth. Umaytsaysav really means his emergence, his connection to it is not that he's born in Bethlehem. I'm adding in those words, so bracketing in, but the origin is from the old days. So Micah is referring to the birth of King David in Bethlehem as old days because it happened 300 years ago. Got it? You got it? You got it? I get that question a lot, and I, this is a great opportunity to address that. The author of Matthew can't let that last part stand. He erases that end, and his origins are from early days, from ancient times. He has to just take it out, takes his scissor and cuts it out, and he installs and said, he will be a shepherd over Israel, skipping a verse and taking a passage from two verses later. Got it? So what the author Matthew does is he literally cuts out a whole section beginning from the end of 5-2 and cutting out the following verse and going to the following and then putting in, if you read it in Matthew 2-6, it reads, and he'll be a shepherd over Israel. Whoa, what happened is his origins are from old, from ancient times. And I'm telling you, men and women— just hold two Bibles side by side. If you're doing this online, open two separate browsers. I don't want you to get this wrong. I don't want to stay on this point a long time, but you need to get this right. You need to see it in front of your eyes. I don't want you to take my word for it. I need you to see it for yourself, what the author of Matthew has done. He has corrupted the text. He just dislodged a piece. He cut out a piece, jettisoned it, and put in, he'll be a shepherd over Israel, which is found in the following passage, and slammed it together. And you are then lost in the church celebrating Christmas. Because you think there's a prophecy in the book of Micah that prophesies that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem when the actual passage is a prophecy that the Messiah will have is from the dynasty of King David, and David, who is from ancient times, was the one who was born in Bethlehem, not the Messiah. This is one of 11 fulfillment citations of the book of Matthew. All of them are corrupt. All of them are filthy. All of them are dirty. All of them are sketchy. Not one clear text. Okay. Now we are going to move on. Listen very carefully. There's a lot at stake here for you. He is then told, this story never happened. This is a plot device. In order to get Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, this is the purpose of Matthew and Luke, but they each, each use a different plot device that are mutually exclusive of each other. The purpose of this is to, how do we get Jesus to be born in Bethlehem when everyone knows he's from Nazareth? Now, the magic star takes them to Jerusalem. This is very important. Listen carefully. This is not any star as is characterized in the book of Matthew. This is a magic star. This magic star knows how to find Jerusalem when you're in Persia. And that's around a thousand kilometers away, east. So it's people from the east. The, the Magi then get the information that the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem, and the star then begins to move. The star goes, oh, now I'm putting that in, but what is there is that, oh, and the star then moves from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Just so you know, Jerusalem and Bethlehem are really close. You can easily walk from Jerusalem to Bethlehem in a few hours. And from some parts of Jerusalem, you can do it in less— I mean, some parts of Jerusalem, you can—it's right there. It's like you can—it's just very, very close. Okay, I don't know if it's like it depends on what part of Jerusalem, but it's just really close. It's a little south. It's in Judea. Hebron is a little further. I don't want to confuse you. This magic star, without knowing which house Jesus is born in, knows to stop over the home of the Messiah where Jesus was born. 
Like, how did the star even know that? Like, no one is. Like, if you ask me, where does Charlie live? And I said, in Bethlehem, you go, what street does he live on? Like, where in Bethlehem? The star knows. The star, it's more than GPS because the star suddenly becomes a genius. Whereas the star before just knew to go to Herod's palace in Jerusalem, now the star can figure out where in Bethlehem does, was the Messiah born. The, the Magi then come at the home of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and they worship the child. And they, they of course, bring gifts, okay? Now, the way the story continues is Herod the Great is alerted by this that, whoa, the Messiah, the king of the Jews, is born in Bethlehem? We need to kill this child. Why? Because I'm the king, and I don't want competition. Herod then orders that every child born in Bethlehem, every child that's two years old and younger has to be executed in, in Bethlehem. Okay? The slaughter of the innocents. This story did not happen. There is no mention of every child in Bethlehem being executed by Herod the Great. It just didn't happen. The point, the point is that whereas the Gentiles are looking to serve and worship Messiah, they just they're not they're not like as smart as the Jews, but they just want to worship the truth. The Jews want to kill the Messiah, and destroy the innocent. That's the story that's going on here. In Matthew chapter 2, Joseph is told, you need to take the child and marry and get out of here because Herod is looking to kill the child. Go to Egypt and be thou there until I give thee word, for Herod is seeking the child to destroy him. So Joseph took the holy family, Mary and Jesus, and they went to Egypt and were there until the death of Herod, that it might be filled from the scripture, out of Egypt have I called my son. I'm not kidding. It's Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, 14 and 15. If you look up that text, which is from the book of Hosea, another contemporary of Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, all lived the exact same time, and you read the text from the beginning, it's not talking about the Messiah going to Egypt. If you go to Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, we have another crime committed by Matthew, another fake fulfillment citation. The original text in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. Matthew once again pulls the scam and just rips out the whole beginning of Hosea chapter 11 and just takes the last words, Out of Egypt have I called my son, and he quotes that, and he jettisons the whole first part. This is so crazy. So crazy. So Matthew 2, 6 and Matthew 2, 15 do the same thing but reversed. And Matthew 2, 6, the author of Matthew removes the end of the original verse from Micah and preserves the beginning. However, in Matthew 2, verse 15, the author does the same thing but reverse. He preserves the end and eradicates and jettisons the beginning. Please, 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 please look it up for yourself. Please. Before you go to church on December 25th, say, you know what? I'm going to look this up for myself. I don't want to defile myself anymore. I'm done with that. And I encourage you to do the following. Open up your Bible. I don't care what Bible you have. Please open up two Bibles. Open up one Bible to Matthew 2, verse 15. And then the second one, I want you to open up to Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Please do this. Because the time is now to repent. The time is now to turn away from this filth. And I'm saying, don't trust me. And don't even, you don't have to even use a Jewish Bible for this. Use whatever you want. You can use a Bible that has a giant cross on it. I don't care. In this case, it doesn't make a difference. Look, 
if you love God, and I have a feeling that you're not watching this because I have a nice blue shirt. You're watching this for edification because you want to serve God in truth. And you want to be loyal to him. And you're done with serving men. And you want to serve the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you want to know if the book of Matthew is reliable or if it is filled with, with lies and sin. If it's a theological crime scene. If you want to know, did Matthew accurately characterize what it says in the Hebrew Bible or not? Don't you want to know? Aren't you curious whether Christianity is a false religion or not? If it's a true religion, celebrate it. But if it isn't, run from it. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm not asking you to don't buy my book. Forget that. Just Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, please. And Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. So in Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, we are told by the author that the family going to Egypt, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, going to Egypt in order to flee Herod the Great that's seeking to kill the Messiah is a fulfillment of a passage found in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. I want you to look at your Christian Bible carefully because I want you to know that this is, I'm not making this up. If you look at Matthew 2, verse 15, in the footnote, it will always say in the Christian Bible that this is a reference, this is a quote of Hosea 11, verse 1. I'm not setting up a straw man and toppling it. I am steel manning this. I am presenting the Christian belief and teaching accurately, rigorously. Now, go back to Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, and read it in context. When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and out of Egypt have I called my son. It's not talking about the Messiah. It's not even talking about going to Egypt, talking about an exodus from Egypt. Matthew just dumped the beginning and just kept the end. How do you play with my Bible? And if you're going to play with my Bible, you think I'm going to convert to Christianity, get baptized? Because what? Matthew should be put in jail for this. You would go to jail for this if you did this in torts in a courtroom. But lawyers are disbarred for behaving like this with, with contracts. This is the kind of stuff that gets you thrown in jail. This is a crime. Okay. Now, I need to address one other point. It should be bothering you. It should sound, the story should sound weird for another reason. That is, if the star had magical powers that it was able to identify the home in which Jesus was born in, the Joseph and Mary home, why do they need Herod? Why did why the stop off in the palace? Why is that inserted in the story? Got it? That means if the star is magical and could find the home of the Messiah, because there's no information imparted in the palace of Herod of where in Bethlehem does the child live, which home it is. So the star knows so why it's a completely vestigial part of the story. Why do you need it? Why didn't the star take the why does the star take why doesn't the star just take the Magi straight from the east straight to Bethlehem? Why the stop off in Jerusalem to find out Bethlehem? No, because that's not enough information. You see, the reason is, is to contrast, Matthew is incentivized to contrast the behavior of the Jews when the Jews discover who the Messiah is and how the Gentiles do. When the Gentiles discover that there's a Messiah born, they want to find him and worship him and bring gifts. When the Jews find out, they want to kill everybody to make sure they could eradicate the Messiah. They are enemies of God. That story, that characterization follows throughout the gospel, and 
explodes in Matthew 27, which is a, a passion narrative rather than an infancy narrative. Because there we have a similar kind of setting. You have Gentiles and Jews observing Jesus' trial and reacting completely in a completely different fashion to Jesus. Whereas Pontius Pilate and his wife think Jesus is innocent. And Pontius Pilate goes through the ritual of literally washing his hands of this because he wants nothing to do with it because he sees this man, Jesus, as innocent, as does his wife. The only mention of Pontius Pilate's wife in all of the Christian Bible, she's had a dream about Jesus the night before, and she knows that Jesus is innocent. And the Jews are screaming, crucify him. And in verse 25, scream, we take his blood upon ourselves and our children. You want to know why Christians hate Jews? Because of passages like that. Christians aren't crazy for hating us. When you take that kind of grotesque story and you, you vilify the Jews as the Jews are the enemies of God from the get-go, that's the key. It's like the bookends. From the birth to the death, the Jews are in it. And then the Jews further, the, the leaders of the Jews, who find out from the Roman soldiers who were there to guard the, the tomb of Jesus, stupidly they have the guarding beginning on Saturday, so someone could have taken the body out Friday night. That never happened. None of that happened. Just a silly mistake in the book of Matthew. But when the guards come back and they're, oh, they're being offered bribes to shut up about the story and say that you fell asleep. Like when they discover, when the, when the priests discover that Jesus really does resurrect from the dead, that means that he really cannot. Like why don't they just believe in Jesus then? Like do you need more proof? No, they're still on the side of Satan because they are the seed of the devil, John 8, 44. These Christians that hate Jews and think the Jews are are the enemies of God, they're not bad. They've just been, their minds have been polluted. They've been just completely brainwashed by these s s terrible stories. These lies, and what I'm do, what I want to illustrate to you is this is it's not like well, he's a rabbi. He he wants to show why the Jews are good and the Christians are bad. No, that's why I'm saying let's take empirical evidence. Forget me. Like just open your Bible. So what what, what you need to do, I I just would encourage you to do, is take whatever Bible is in your home. Compare Matthew two verse six to to Micah five verse two. Just side by side. You got the Bible on your computer. You could just open up two browsers and look it up for yourself. In that case, Matthew removed the end of Micah 5.2. Just removed it and put something else in his place. He'll be a shepherd over Israel. Okay? Deleted, and his origins are from ancient times, uh, from days of old, from ancient times. Deletes that, gone, disappeared eradicated, replaced with he'll be a shepherd over Israel, grabs that from a couple of verses later. So, okay, you need to see that. This is not the ranting of a rabbi in Jerusalem who doesn't want you to be a Christian. I'm, this is empirical evidence that the author of the book of Matthew lied to you. Okay? Don't use my Bible. Use yours. The more Christy, the better, because then you know, okay, and again, move forward to Matthew 2.15. Same chapter, we're still in the infancy narrative, and compare Matthew 2, verse 15, to Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. In that case, it's the beginning of the Jewish Bible quote that's eradicated when Israel was a child, then I loved and called my... And that part is stricken, and the only part that's quoted is the end of Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Look up Matthew 2.15 and open up Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 and compare them. Is Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 a prophecy about the Messiah? No. But if you read in Matthew, you won't know that. Why not? Because the church has lied to you. 
The church deliberately quoted the very end of Hosea 11, verse 1, because they want you to remain in the church and to give tithes and to believe in a false god. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu allowed them to do something so stupid and not correct it so any person could walk away from this filth, run away from this spiritual dirt. That's why it's so transparent. Other religions, it may be more difficult to prove that it's a scam, it's a lie. Here it's transparent. So the story didn't happen, but and what I also want to illustrate, what I'm, I am illustrating to you is that the story is designed, the plot device is designed to have a stop off in Jerusalem to demonstrate, for no other reason, doesn't add to the story, to, in order to illustrate this is how Jews react to Christ and this is how Gentiles react to Christ. Herod and his hordes want to kill the Messiah. The king of the Jews wants to kill the Messiah and the Gentiles want to revere the Messiah. And then it goes further. I, mean, I don't know, I, you want to go further and then... Of course, you know, Joseph and Mary want to go back home to Bethlehem, but they're told that actually uh, Matthew, excuse me, that Herod the Great is dead, and his son Herod Archelaus, who was crazier than his father, is now in control of Judea, and this is a, do not, you know, you can't go back to Bethlehem, which is your hometown, but rather go to Nazareth. And the, the Magi are informed not to, to go back the way you came so that no one finds out where the no one finds out where the child's born. So the Gentiles, the simple Gentiles, are protecting the Messiah from Herod, whereas the Jews are trying to kill him, trying to kill the Messiah. This is so clear, so transparent. I, I, I'm not gonna go off here, but just one Luke has the whole thing the opposite. The family starts out in Nazareth. There's, they make their way to Bethlehem and have to stay in a barn because there's no room at the end. That's pure El source. And then they don't go to Egypt. They go back after the proper time. They go back a month later. They go back to Nazareth, stopping off in Jerusalem for Mary to bring the proper offerings as prescribed in the book of Leviticus. There's no Egypt there. It doesn't exist there. Two opposite stories that both could not have happened, let alone Matthew places the birth of Jesus prior to the death of Herod the Great, whereas Luke has Jesus born around 11 years later. I can go on and on. Look it up for yourself. Turn to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Rid yourself of this filth. Wash yourself. Touch nothing unclean. And turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Happy Hanukkah.